A massive round of applause, please, for our leader of the council, Councillor Darren Cooper. Darren, you were born to John and Norma Cooper on December the 17th, 1963, at St Chad's Hospital in Birmingham. It's my birthday next week, Phil. Your birthday next week, yes, I've You can that. send me an email card if you want. Absolutely. And you're the oldest of three and the only one born in, in hospital. Now, you've lived in Smedic, like me, uh, all your life and went to Crockett's Lane Infant School. At the age of seven, you went to Parkside Junior School and then on to Smedic Hall Boys School. Um, and you were the first member of uh, the family to go to university, and that was back in 1996. <laughs> Um, I ain't going to live this one down. Definitely not. But tell us, Darren, a bit about your childhood when you were growing up in Smethwick. Well, uh, Windmill Lane is uh, predominantly where um, I, I grew up. It's, uh, at the, for people outside of Smethwick, it was a, it's a so-called notorious uh, estate, council estate. I, I've never seen it uh, in, in that context. And, and to be fair, Phil, I had some really happy times. We were poor people. Um, in the 60s and 70s growing up, growing up, my father was in and out of work, um, but in those days you could go from one job to another job in, 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 certain, in certain fields, you know, predominantly he's a working class man, liked his ten pints of beer, you know, on a Friday night, and we, it was good growing up in Smethwick, mm -hmm. it, it was good growing up in Windmill Lane, you know, um, dip, even then there were people from different backgrounds, different cultures, right? predominantly a black community and uh, some Indian, uh, Indian community as well. So, you know, it, it wasn't that... We were poor, we didn't have a lot, right? I mean, I can remember having a sugar sandwich, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, um, when, uh, when the old fella was out of work. But, it, you know, they, they did the best to, to, to bring us up in, in the best possible way. But it sounded yeah, but like you, you had a happy childhood. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in the, towards the, the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of the council uh, uh, estate blocks of flats, uh, I don't know whether people know, Brook Street, Price Street, around that area, mm -hmm. there's a lot of masonettes. Those were all being built then. Yeah. So, of course, as kids, we used to have fantastic funding. We'd dodging in and out the trenches, <laughs> right, that they were big into, but, you know, to put the foundations of these, these new properties. We thought it was all wonderful, yeah. you know. And then, obviously, like, Victoria Park as well was there. And it's great now that Victoria Park's back to what it was like mm. in today now, what it was like when, when I was a kid, you know, and recently got its uh, green flag status. So, yeah, in the main, it was, it, it, it was good. You know, there were some tough times, yeah. you know, and I mean, kids of my age, you know, I'm not, you know, I weren't the, the most innocent of kids. And I mean, you talked about school, um, you know, I, uh, I went to local, to, to local school, to Crocketown Infants and then to Parkside, you know, and I was in the headmaster's office a few times, Phil. Yeah. Um, you know, and my dad and mum had to go up to the school. I was a bit of a rebel yeah. leader, and, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, when I went to senior school, I left school with no qualification. Yeah. Well, I had, what was it then in them days, Paul Pidicle tell me if you, yeah, he's sitting there. CSE, elementary maths and English, because I just messed about, yeah. you know, and I, I weren't, you know, and I'd see a lot of uh, young people now who don't engage in the education system. Yeah. Right, and I can see why some of them don't, because, you know, they don't want to sit in a classroom <laughs> and being taught and, and all the rest of it. And, so I can, I can relate to, to, to some of that, but you know, I keep telling these young people around Windmill Lane now uh, is, to get, um, is, is to get a good education, really. Mm. But I can, I can also relate to why they, they choose to mess about. So when did, he, when did you become Darren Cooper, the, uh, well, as I said, the teddy boy? What was oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, every, every teenager goes through uh, the various fads. There's a few lads, mates, and that I used to knock round with. Some of them became rockers, some of them became mods. I thought, don't like them. To you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be a, a teddy boy because yeah. my mum and dad uh, uh, were from that era of the 50s and the 60s with rock and roll. And when we used to go to family do's, and I used to see my mum and dad doing the rock and roll, you know. And and it I just and the other thing was of course, right? Elvis Presley died. And it was massive, that was, you know. I mean, we had a telly, it was only a black and white one, right? But, uh, <laughs> right, but everybody, like, you know, it was like, yeah, oh, this man, who is this man, yeah. the king of rock and roll? 
And it really gave me a bit of a buzz, you know, and I thought, I'm going to get a DA haircut, have the slide down. Yeah, I think we've got one on there. Oh, on the screen at the moment, absolutely. <laughs> I forgot about that. It was the Mayor's Charity, wasn't it? But, uh, but I, mean, I mean, that was a bit of a, for me, uh, uh, a sort of fulfilling of a bit yeah. of something, you know, because I've always liked Elvis Presley. And, and, but also a lot of influence around music and, uh, uh, of my life at that time was because there was a, uh, a big black community. It was reggae yeah. music. You know, um, John Holt and people like that, you know, so that it, was a, it, it, it was a mixture. So it was a bit of a, I just wanted to be different really, Phil. So I had the crepe sole shoes and the uh, drain pipe trousers and the, and the DA haircuts and all that sort of stuff. But I soon realised when I hit 18, that perhaps the opposite sex uh, didn't quite think that I was that, you know. Yeah. The cool He's a bit odd, isn't he? Yeah. You know, kind of thing. So they didn't think it was too cool. No. So, and then when I started working in the NHS, I changed. I, to, I, I changed. Uh, yeah. I kept the hairstyle, but changed the clothes. Just for the protection of the patients, yeah. probably more than anything. Yeah. The the influences you you've talked about musical influences. What, what have been? Who have been the main influences on 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 your life as you were growing up? Uh, probably my dad, most mm. for for first and foremost, but. Definitely, yeah, definitely, in terms of my politics and where I get my politics and values around politics, my, it was definitely my father. Hmm. Um, in the 60s, my old fella stood for the Communist Party in the ward that I now represent as a Labour councillor. Mm -hmm. um, and as a kid, we, you know, young, young, young lad, we used to go around the streets. Because once the old man realised he was never going to get elected as a communist, he, uh, in this country, he, uh, he, he, he sort of became a little bit more towards the Labour Party and he used to help out the local MP at the time, he was Andrew Folds. And of course, we, I used to go around as a kid on the back of this Land Rover with this famous actor from, who was our local MP. At the end of the day, the, he, you know, he was a bit of an inspiration to me as well. And I thought, mm, one day I'd like to do this because I'd like to make a difference. Uh, for, for for this area, because mm. he, he, he at the time Andrew Foles lived in Staff, uh, Stratford. I think. Yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I thought, well, how can he how can he relate to us in Smethwick if you don't even know where the local shop is or uh, you know? But to be fair, I'd probably doing the guy, God bless him, a bit of an injustice. But overall, that's that that's where I got my politics from. But the the other big influence for me was actually in secondary school. Mm. And I never, pick, I never kind of picked it up until I hit the fourth year. I don't know what they call it now. Um, and they, because I was always messing about, but they made me a school prefect. And it kind of gave me a bit of responsibility. Yeah. And I think I started to knuckle down, but it was a bit too late to actually, if you like, get the, uh, the O levels or what it was at that time. So I left school with his city and guilds in engineering qualification because I wanted to be an electrician at that time. Um, so that was about no, that was 1980. Within a year of getting that um, that job, uh, that, that leaving school, I should say, I got a job as an apprentice uh, trainee electrician. But within a year of that, all of the jobs in Smedic just and I was uh, made redundant for mm. the first time ever. Um, and that's when I started doing a bit of voluntary work. Yeah. Uh, because at the time, Dad was working at All Saints Hospital. I don't know whether many people will know, know All Saints, but it, it's still there, but it's part of the prison now, Winds and Green Prison. And I started going to work with him for summer to do because I was so bored, there were no yeah. jobs around. And that's how I got uh, involved in becoming a psychiatric nurse, Phil. And you then became a father. You've got three children. You've got two boys and a girl, and two years ago you, you married Karen, after being together for, for ten years. Yeah, was yeah. it a slow burning relationship? Well, <laughs> oh, you could say that, but I was married. I was, you know, I mean, I, I was married before. Some people who know me and they will know that I've been married before. Unfortunately, life is the way it is sometimes, and things don't work out the way you want them to be. And uh, yeah, I've got three great kids. Yeah, um, but my first child was. Uh, Matthew, and then I was on my own for quite some time, mm. and uh, and then I met Karen at work. Actually, she was the uh, secretary for uh, 
for one of the consultants and we got reheated off like, yeah, we spent 10 years together and then a couple of years ago we decided having having a chat in the kitchen, shall we get married? She said yes, I said yes, two weeks, done and dusted. Spent two, <laughs> spent two, spent two weeks in, uh, we got married and then the next day we flew out to uh, Zanti for two weeks. So ten years and then two weeks, none of yeah, that yeah. difference is it really? Um, you were, you've been a ward councillor now for some, some years and quite a passionate one, I, mm. I, I sort of believe. Um, when you first became a ward councillor, how, how did it feel? Well, at the time I was 26 or 27 when I got elected. I think I was, there was a group of us that were around that age. Yeah. Um, Adam Carey, myself, Richard Young, people might remember. So there's a new batch, if you like, of new kids on the block. Uh, but for me, it was probably one of the most memorable days of my life when you know, they announced that I'd been elected for the ward. Mm. that I'd grown up in all my life, you know. I mean, I went out the next day after the... I was, like, on a buzz like for, like, a few days, and people were... I was going around, and people were shaking me hand and saying, oh, it's brilliant, you know, we've got one of our own. And it made me re really, really proud. Um, and I've now been on the council in May next year, 21 years. Mm. So, man and boy, if you like. Um, and over that time, I think I've gained uh, a lot of experience of how councils work. But I am, you know, always and always will continue to be passionate about yeah. the people I represent. And for, and for yeah, that, they, they to me are, they come first and yeah. foremost. Because, yeah, you've said that many times. You know, and I think from, you know, without being political, the Labour Party in Samwell is blessed in a sense. This has been a Labour council for well over 30 years. <laughs> and people continue to stick. Oh, I think we're a sensible council. You know, we don't, yeah, we make mistakes from time to time, and I think if we do, we ought to put our hands up. And I've often gone on in the press and on the radio and said, we've got that wrong, sorry. Mm. You know, we, we're, we're human and the staff, are, the great staff that we have are delivering the services for us from time to time make mistakes, it's life. But you know, so you know what the media's like. Sometimes they give us good stories, Sometimes they, 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 they treat us a bit yeah. rough, I think. But overall, you know, I think uh, we're, we're a good council. And going on to two years ago now, mm. 2009, I think it was the 1st of December, was it? Yeah. Uh, you became leader of the council. Um, you talk about when you were first announced as the ward councillor for your ward and how proud you felt then. How did you feel when you became leader of Sandwell Council? Oh, Phil, to be honest with you, the... I think back on it now and I, you know, sometimes now I have to pinch myself mm. um, because, you know, to become leader of the, you know, we've got at the moment, at the time I think we had 55 Labour councillors. We have a, a, a good, strong cabinet, all good, mm. good people who are as passionate about this borough and as passionate about the people who live in this borough as I am. And, you know, a few of the group were saying, Darren, you know, we need... A fresh look, we need somebody who's got a lot more, a bit more enthusiasm and a bit more get up and getting some new ideas, you know, because I've been pushing the leader at that time uh, and the chief executive at that time for bigger change, for better change, you know, to do things differently, to move away from the way that we've always done this and we've always done that and the bureaucracy of the organisation, you know. I'm, talk about the level, you know, we had f from the chief executive to somebody, his boots still here, was he gone? Boots, the big lad at the back from Sir, he's working for Serco now. But the message from the chief executive to someone like him who's litter picking, right, was becoming so confused. Mm. And if you're going to have a vision, if you're going to have change and you're going to move things forward in the interests of local people, right, then you've got to have everybody, well, nearly everybody, I would say, having ownership of what it is that yeah. you're trying to achieve. Otherwise, the message gets... It's like Chinese whispers, isn't mm. it? You know, you start... The chief executive says, the leader says, we will do this. And by the time it gets to the bottom, right, it's the road sweeper says, we're going to do it. Yeah. So the messages are all getting mixed up. Despite the best efforts, I don't want to rubbish anybody from the past, right, because we've seen some... Good people go from this council under, you know, under the circumstances that we face. But we needed a different focus. And went to the Labour group 
and elected as the le as leader of the Labour group initially, right, unopposed, overwhelming support, you know, and it was I went home and I had tears in my eyes, yeah. well, to be honest. I ain't gonna do the Pierce Morgan thing and start crying, let me tell you. <laughs> right, but um, you know, at the end of the day, I still now I still think, you know, how 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 passionate and how sort of emotional mm. I felt about it at that time. And did you did you learn a lot from, from the late Bill Thomas? Yeah. Um, I think he was a traditional leader of a traditional council and he had some, some visions and God bless him he had a whole heap of money, yeah, that was handed down um, to to Samwa uh, via the via the Labour government and it's a different ball game now. Mm. And Bill uh, led from the old traditional of the committee structure, from from the political system, to the new to the cabinet and scrutiny system that we have now. Yeah, where you know you have the cab you have cabinet members with, with portfolios. I've reshaped that again slightly, and I will continue to reshape that. I've cut um, the cost of governance of the council. I've frozen members' allowances in the line with public sector workers, which I think is the right thing to do. I've even cut the chief executive's pay, God bless him, you know, because I think that is also, again, the right thing to do. Mm. And we've lost, obviously, a significant amount of senior officers. So I was thrown into the job, Phil. And then initially. the world changed largely because obviously nobody would have probably suspected or expected what was going to happen over the last 12 months or so. It's been, mm. a, it's been a difficult year, obviously, for, for Sandwell, for members like yourself, mm. for the people at the very top uh, of the council in terms of senior officers, but also for employees. And we've, we recently had an employee survey, and in that employee survey there was a lot of negativity around morale. Mm -hmm. around things like job security, people feeling anxious, seeing their colleagues leave, um, expecting their colleagues to leave mm -hmm. at, at some point in the mm -hmm. future. And that has burdened them, obviously, with more work, more responsibility, a lot of emotion going on at the mm -hmm. moment. As a, as a member and as a leader of the council, what do you say to those employees at the moment who are feeling those, those raft of emotions? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first and foremost, Phil, at the end of the day, yes, it's been tough on politicians, but I don't think it has been as tough on politicians as it has on the people who work for Samwell Council. Um, what I would say to people is, you know, I don't come into politics to do what we're having to do at this moment in time. And if anybody thinks for one minute that I don't think about people losing their jobs day in and day out, given the fact that I myself I'm a public sector worker. I'm a nurse with 30 years experience and I am having to reapply for my own job. I'm currently on the at-risk register and if I don't get that job, I probably will be made redundant. So I, I can't share the experience of every, every individual member of the council or employee of the council but I certainly have my own personal experience of what people are going through at this moment in time. I came onto Samwell Council to make a difference, not to cut jobs, not to cut services in the way that we're having to cut them and if I had a real, real choice Phil, I certainly would not do it the way that it's been done at the moment. This council's had, took out last year 31 million pounds. Now Jan talked about the other 90% of the budget that we still have, which is true. We still have significant resources, but most of that resource is tied up in his salaries and jobs. And the office of, what is it called? I can never get this right. The offices of this thing that the Chancellor set up, business or whatever it's called, mm. It's supposed to be an independent body, suggested last week that a further 700,000 public sector jobs could go between now and 2015. Even in Thatcher's day, nurses and social workers were never made redundant. You know, and it, 
it makes my skin crawl, mm. yeah, to do and to have to take some of the decisions that we've had to take. And Phil, I would also say that I probably would have made some of the changes that we've made at the top. Yeah, we had far too many senior managers in this council. I'm not being rude or dismissive of anybody who's gone. We've had good people leave. I've been saddened by some of the people that have left the mm. council. But I'll come back to the politics. First and foremost, the people who elect me, yeah, are the people that I have to speak up for yeah. first. Secondly, are the staff that deliver the services because without them, the, 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 pe the, people would, the local people would be even more upset. And I believe that some of the things that we've done, that I've done as leader of the council, have been given us, put us in a good position to try and protect frontline jobs. It's been tough and it's going to be even tougher, mm. but we still have a significant amount of money as a local authority to spend. But as they continue to cut us, we're looking at another potentially up to £19 million again next year. Inevitably, you can only cut so much bureaucracy and so much fat, yeah. and then you have to start cutting services. And that is the part for me that is most difficult of all. But to, you, you to talk about with. pride, though, with, with, with not only what you do, but obviously a lot of pride's coming from you for the staff that are putting in a big shift at the moment for, for, for Samuel yeah. Council. And, and obviously that's, that's almost depicted in some of the customer results that we've had recently mm -hmm. from, the, from the My Council roadshows mm -hmm. that took place over yeah. the summer. In spite of all what's going on, in spite of the, the horrendous cuts that are being made across services, staff are clearly working incredibly hard because the customers are telling us that, aren't they? Well, absolutely. If you look at some of the uh, customer, recent customer surveys, people are actually, local people are actually saying the services are getting better. Mm. The street cleaning, the potholes, yeah, those are the services that people, the, the bin collections, the recycling, these are the services that the majority of people see. Only a certain amount of people use ed the education system, only a certain amount of people use children's services and mm. adult services. Yeah, they're essential services because it's, you know, politically and morally, from my point of view, we have to protect the weak and the vulnerable. Mm. But the vast majority of people out there who don't know that, about these services or don't never engage in these services are only interested that their streets are safe, yeah. they're clean, they're, you know, there's good street lighting, there's no potholes. Yeah, and their bins are collected on time. And survey after survey after survey has told us that. And the latest survey suggests that things are improving. So the, f the ideology for me about paying fewer people more, yeah, seems to be working, despite the fact that we are losing people. Yeah. And some people have chose to go of their own volition. And we've tried to, and I've tried to, and we have a political position on this that we've tried to reduce as much as possible compulsory redundancies in the yeah, council yeah. by you know, doing things differently, by moving people around uh, to a certain extent. But it's inevitable, you know, I think, that if we continue, or the government continues, not us, the government continues on this path, yeah, that we will lose more jobs. And I'm very, very mm. regretful and sorry about that. But your mission or your aim from day one has been to get this council to a status of excellence. Mm. We've clearly gone on the road to that and we talk now across many services that they've been rated as good or even better than good. Yeah. But what would excellence look like to you as leader of Samuel Council? Well, first and foremost, what I don't want to see is a load of tick boxes. Mm. Yeah? What I'm interested in and what I'm passionate about is what the residents of this borough say about this council. What they, how they judge, how they judge whether we're excellent or not. That is the most important thing to me. You know, they set up, I mean, the last Labour government and we set up all these uh, various bodies to monitor this and monitor that and monitor the other, because simply that all governments don't, uh, have not trusted local government to deliver. 
But I think if you look around this borough and you see some of the things that are going on in Samwell, even in this economic climate, yeah, yeah there's, you know, we've got the great people. We're definitely demonstrating we've got the great prospects. You know, the only way is up, even still against this, you know, diabolical economic situation that we find ourselves in. And you, you sort of knock on people's doors regularly in terms of canvassing at various mm -hmm. times of the year, obviously. And again, you've said to me on occasions, you've, you've noticed a clear difference from what people yeah, are yeah. telling you yeah. year on year about, yeah. about Sandwell Council. Yeah, well, people are, you know, people are saying that, the, that they believe that the council services are getting better. Mm. The streets are cleaner. We've still got a problem with litter. We, 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 we've tried the, you know, the educational approach through schools and through uh, neighbourhood uh, forums, etc., etc. And we've also uh, tried the enforcement approach, which also the and we've got criticised for that. But then, to be fair, uh, we did get some national media coverage, right, where they referred to us as the Singapore of England. Yeah. Right, because Singapore apparently you can eat your, street, uh, eat your dinner off the streets. There's still an issue there around litter and stuff, but we're cracking it and local people are telling me, you know, let's look at last winter. Only council around, yeah, and some of the people here were drove in from other boroughs where the roads were clear mm. of snow. Yeah, we've introduced this thing recently. It's not a gimmick, right, this thing around snow champions. Yeah. What I'm trying to do with that, it costs 23 grand, yeah? What we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with that is tap into that community spirit, not get people to do the job for us, because this, you know, no council can clear every road and every footpath of snow and ice, yeah? But certainly, if we can tap into that community spirit that we've got in this borough, you know, we can get people clearing the snow for old, for old people from the front door or one, or disabled people from the front door or the paths and all the rest of it. Mm. We have that community spirit there, so all we've done is just impact, give people the tools in which to do it. Now, if one, it costs 23 grand, as I said, if one person, older person, it doesn't fall over this winter because the snow has been cleared, hypothetically, you know, the average hip replacement, Tony's a man on them, I'll tell you, Probably about 25 grand. If we stop one or two people in the whole of Samwell falling over this winter and breaking a limb mm -hmm. or breaking a hip, that's, that scheme's paid for itself. Whichever way you recycle the money, it's all ta taxpayers' money, isn't it? Absolutely. So. Let's go back to you as a man then. Darren Cooper, West Bromwich Albion or fishing? <laughs> Which one do you prefer most? The baggies. Yeah, well, everyone, kn <laughs> everyone knows that... Um, I'm a big Albion fan. I've been uh, since I was uh, knee high to a grasshopper, as they say, Phil. Tell you a little story. When we were kids growing up on, on Windmill Lane, you can see the Hawthorns from Windmill Lane. And uh, we used to trot along there, walk along and, and go up Alfred's Lane, down Windmill Lane and up into Alfred's Lane, over the bridge by the Blue Gates, up the hill, and uh, trot up to the Albion, you know. and. I used to sneak in, Phil, when I was a kid. I used to sneak in. Is that gap we, at the smithy again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, so, me and about eight of my mates, you know, we used to sort of like just go along and never, because we didn't look, you know, pocket money, pocket money, I had a paper and all the rest of it. We never had enough money to get in the Albion, right? But um, so we used to sneak in. But we got to know some of the people on the turnstiles. I think that's why that Jeremy Peace changed to them uh, smart cards. <laughs> right, because he, he found out that I used to sneak in the album. Because some of the lads on the turnstiles used to let us in. Mm. To, you know, just before the game started. So, and then when I obviously started earning some money, uh, when I started nursing, I bought, me, bought a, a season ticket and I've had one ever since. I think football in the winter, I'm going to dodge the question a little bit. Football is definitely Albion in the winter and in the summer it's fishing. I got, you know, with what I do, because I'm still working as a psychiatric nurse, you know, as well as being leader of the council, um, I need an outlet sometimes mm. and five hours. I match fish, right? So I've got, um, got it's about 16 of us in the club. Right, and we fish fish contests in the in the mornings and afternoons and stuff, and then 
have a beer and stuff and all the, uh, as you do. Um, but, uh, and the fishing, five hours fishing. No mobile phone, no iPad, no nothing. Just me, the lake, and, a, and, and me fishing. It just, it chills me, yeah. so. And then I'd ventilate all my feelings uh, at the Albion, as Paul will tell you. Yeah, and at the fish so, in the summer. Yeah, yeah. and the, as, you know, the, the end of the day, let off a bit of steam, the ref, or is it? You know, etc., yeah. etc. Et cetera. You let that bit of steam off, you know. But also, you know, it reminds me of who I am. Mm. Because despite all the money that's in football at the moment, for me, football is still a working class yeah. uh, sport, right? And, you know, education or no education, I still see myself as a working class man, you know. And, I, you know, at the end of the day, we want everyone to aspire. Right, but I do think that social class still plays a mm -hmm. significant part in people's lives, and even more so now. So, as, as, as we talk about the future, then it must excite you because you've talked about great people, and by great people, you've talked about not only the employees that work for Samuel Council but the people who live in this borough as great people. We've talked about the place itself, mm. um, and you growing up in Smethwick, and touching on to great prospects now. It must mm. excite you that there's so much regeneration activity going on yeah. that you can see with your own eyes emerging from the ground, so to speak, not only in, in West Bromwich, but also in your own hometown of Smethwick and other mm. areas of, of Sandwell. That must be exciting for you to, to watch as a leader of the council. It is, it is Phil, um, but some of the plans or some of the things that we're now seeing come to fruition, like the Tesco's development, the college, the public, I think I was over at, what is it, not Providence Place, because that's a long shark, isn't it? Pros uh, Prospectus Place over there, the, the road there the other day, looking out, watching all the little dumper trucks yeah. running around on this site over here. But those plans were put in place 10 years ago. Yeah. And have taken, you know, this long to come to fruition. The important thing, I think, is we could have lost all that because of the economic situation that we now find ourselves in. Um, but we haven't. We've, we've continued. We've got good people like Nick Bobolo and others who are really, really driving the regeneration mm. and transformation agenda. We're talking to businesses all the time about come to Samwell. You know, myself and Jan have done a number of business meetings and we are, you know, and we are despite these economic difficulties, going to see house building continue. Might not be council housing, because this particular government's philosophy around social housing is, is, is different. But we have built new houses in Smethwick, council houses, the first in 35 years, mm -hmm. that's something. You know, there's a lot going on yeah. still, right? The new college is going to be finished, the Tesco thing. So West Bromwich is going to be as we've said all along, our Premier Town, to go with our Premier League football club. Um, but there are still, you know, and then if you even look at Tipton, we're building a new swimming pool, right? We, you know, we, we're not borrowing money. We've got capital. Yeah. We have got capital because of the things that we're doing and, and how we're using the money. The problem is, is that what we haven't got is the revenue. Mm. So that's the sustainable amount of money that you need to you know, for services, but one-off spends like new swimming pools and stuff like that. Mm. So there's still a lot mm. to go on and, you know, you can, we can easily get sucked into the doom and gloom and everything's gonna, going downhill and, mm. and all the rest of it, but we have actually got a lot of positive things going on in this yeah. borough. And on top of that, Phil, what we've got is some damn good people yeah. working for this council, you know, and Never underestimate that members don't appreciate what officers do mm. for this council mm. and what they do for the residents of this borough because every time we meet, yeah, we, can t we talk about the people that are working for the organisation mm. that are making it happen for local people. And it is, in, you know, it's without what the, the staff do, we can't do what we want to no. do. And in terms of you, at some point, Darren, you'll finish as leader of the council. You'll retire, mm. hopefully not yet. 
Um, what do you want your, your sort of, in a few words, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to be saying about Councillor Darren Cooper, once leader of the council? What would you like to hear them say about you? Probably like, I'd like Phil for them to say I'm honest, fair, and that I've made a difference. Yeah. Those are probably the three things that I want people to, to say. In terms of the council, I think for, for local people to say to me, we're proud of our council and that is our council and that our council does a good job. If I can get anywhere near that, given what we face economically, then I'll have achieved my lifelong ambition of making a difference for local people. Because that's why I came into politics. Yep. That's why I stood for, in 1991, the first time to be elected as the councillor for Sir Victoria Ward. That's, you know, what really all I can say. But I certainly didn't come into politics to do some of the things that we're having to do. Yeah. And I hope that people see me and perceive me as somebody who is fair, honest, and just trying to make a difference, and at the same time, understand what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah, that I ain't this big ogre that no. sits in the council offices in Albury, dishes out instructions to the chief executive, yeah, and I don't have any feelings or heart about no. it. Because everybody that goes out the door from this council, right, I feel it. Thank you. Honestly. I think we've managed to ask the right questions. We've got through your life, uh, from the age as a boy right through to a teddy boy. Uh, <laughs> then we got into politics. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you. Um, final message of festivity for the, the staff out there, the managers in this room. What do you say to them? I know these are difficult times, right, and... I know that a lot of people are worried about the future in terms of their jobs. I will try to do all that I can to protect jobs and to protect and offer a, sta a stability to the workforce of the council. And at the same time, manage a careful balance between protecting frontline services to the residents of the borough. It's a difficult juggling act. There's not much money around apart from what we've already got. But take it from me and from the cabinet of this council that we really do appreciate the work that people who work for Samwell Council do. And I say to you, have a good Christmas and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren Cooper, leader of Samwell Council. Thank you, Darren.